The X-Zone radio and TV show is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the X-Zone radio and TV show or in any manner endorsed by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, Talkstar Radio Network, its affiliated stations, or employees. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell Welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and we are coming to you live from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on VORR. That's the voice of reality, a radio and television network around the world. If you'd like to give us a call, our toll-free number is 610-73... I'm sorry, it's 1-800-610-7035. Email is exxon at talkstarradio.com on MSN Messenger, talkstarradio at hotmail.com. And our websites, www.xzoneradio.com, xzonetv.com, and now www.voiceofrealityradio.com. Today is November the 11th in the year 2009, and as I always do every November the 11th, I read a special poem. It's called In Flanders Field by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, who was a doctor in the Canadian Army. In Flanders Field the poppies blow, beneath the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. Today is Remembrance Day, and everyone here at the X-Zone deeply remember and cherish those who fought in every major conflict around the world, protecting us and defending us and maintaining our freedom and our democracy as we have grown to know and love To the soldiers of new in the Middle East, protecting us and fighting the war on terrorism, God bless each and every one of you. Our thoughts and our prayers are with you nightly. And to those members of the families whose soldiers, friends, loved ones, paid the ultimate price, they will never be forgotten. They are the true heroes of the world. And to those who have fought the battles for democracy and freedom over time who are still with us, My heartfelt thanks goes to each and every one of you. Thank you for being there for us. Today is Wednesday, November the 11th, and on this day in history. In 1620, the Pilgrims signed the Mayflower Compact. In 1889, Washington became became a state. On this date in 1921, President Harding dedicated the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Today is, um, let me see, it's uh, just two weeks from Thanksgiving, Thursday. Wow. Already, and Leo DiCaprio turns 35 today. Calista Flockhart turns 45. Demi Moore turns 47. And uh, don't check your mail tonight. I'm trying to save you from an embarrassment uh, that, uh, you know, that you should already know, people. It's Veterans Day. So no matter where you are listening to us around the world, shake the hand of a veteran and say thank you. They, they, many veterans think that people today don't care that they are forgotten. Just shake their hand and say thank you. And you'll see a smile on a face and a tear in an eye 
that will mean so much to you as much as it does mean to them. There are 23.6 million veterans in the U.S. as of 2007. Of those, 1.8 million were female, 2.7 million were black. Uh, Let me see. 1 million were Hispanic, 9.3 million were 65 and older, 1.9 million were younger than 35. And let me see, Americans by uh, veterans by war, 7.9 million Vietnam era veterans, 5 million Gulf War veterans, 2.9 million World War II veterans, 3 million veterans of the Korean War, and 358,000 veterans of both Vietnam and Gulf War eras. When I come back from this two-minute commercial break here on the Exxon, Prasha Prayer is going to be joining me. We're going to be talking about life. After all, we need to do this, and, 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 and Ash is going to tell us all about how the joy is in within each of you. Her website is thejoyiswithinyou.com. That's thejoyiswithinyou.com. My name is Rob McConnell, and to all the members of the military, past and present, thank you for being there for us. And we here at the Exxon and the Exxon Nation, thank you for everything that you have done. And for believing in us so much that you are willing to pay the ultimate price for our freedom. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break in two minutes. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, coming to you live from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My guest this hour is a lady who is going to help us understand a lot in life. Uh, so many people are living at the edge of anxiety at this time, never more evident than before. Times are uncertain, and there are no easy solutions. Today with us is Anata Yogi, a yoga and meditation expert, Asha Praver who's authored a book about a Swami and teaches at www.thejoyiswithinyou.com. And welcome, uh, Asha. And tell me, when did your quest or when did your your trip start into the uh, the work that you do? Um, thank you, Rob. It's nice to be here. Um, I started actually almost exactly 40 years ago. Um, I... I would say, like I'm sure many people would identify with this, that I think I've been a seeker as long as Mm -hmm. I've been conscious. I've always had a very strong sense, even from childhood, that there had to be some deeper rhythm going on to the life that we were living. When I was a child, in fact, I thought that all the adults around me sort of were were, um, possessed this the secret of of life, the, the meaning of life, and that when I got a certain age, they would tell me. And gradually I realized that Everybody was questing for happiness in their own way, but there was no one in my life who seemed to have a clear understanding of where that happiness came from and how to hold it. Um, To me, from that early age, it always seemed to me that everything else that we were doing um, had to be supportive of that happiness and was not necessarily in itself the cause of it. Now, when I got into my late teens, it was the 60s and everything in the culture was really changing, and I was exposed, fortunately, at a very young age to, to the Eastern ideas of spirituality, which essentially meant that consciousness, our, our inner state of consciousness, is the defining reality of life, and that we can influence that state of consciousness <clears throat> by our thoughts, by our actions, by our attitudes. And right in the middle of that, <clears throat> excuse me, mm-hmm. in 1969, Just before Thanksgiving, right now, uh, an American man who calls himself Swami Kriyananda, he's a direct disciple of the author of the book Autobiography of a Yogi. Uh, Many of your listeners, I'm sure, um, have read Autobiography of a Yogi. Once you start a spiritual search outside of the mainstream, um, almost everyone comes sooner or later to Autobiography of a Yogi. It was written by an Indian man named Paramhansa Yogananda. 
Yogananda left this planet in 1952, so there aren't many people still walking around who knew him, but Swami Kriyananda is one of them. He's now in his 80s himself. And Swami Kriyananda dedicated his life to teaching people how to meditate and how to be in tune with the Spirit, how to be in tune with God. And in 1969, he was giving a lecture at Stanford University. I had attended Stanford, but I have to confess I dropped out without getting a degree. And when I went to that lecture and Kriyananda walked into the room, he had a quality about him that I can only say I sensed intuitively. You know, at the time, it seemed like a very radical decision to make, but Mm -hmm. 40 years later, it proved to have been the right one. I could feel that he had in him the kind of joy that I was desperately seeking for myself. Now, understand, my life wasn't even unhappy by anybody's measure, but I I didn't understand how to be, um, it, 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 to influence my own destiny. And that made me feel so insecure. And what I saw in Swamiji was that somehow he had captured that essence of living from the inside. And I made a decision probably in less than a minute, that I was going to devote my life to learning to learning what he knew. Tell me, how did, start, tell, tell me, how did he discover the secret on how to grasp life and take back your own destiny? Well, in his own autobiography, which is a book called The New Path, he mm-hmm. describes himself uh, just about the age I was when I met him, which was like 21 years old. And he he just talked about a, a, an intense inner um, drive to to find a, a deeper meaning behind the, all the apparent changes of life. And he describes a moment, honestly, when he was walking out on the beach, and he he was contemplating the question of is there a God, mm-hmm. and he quickly rejected you know um, dogmatic spiritual solutions. In English, God is a very unfortunate word because it. It doesn't have a meaning. It only has a meaning if somebody puts a dogma to it. But Swamiji, in reflecting deeply, felt that there must be an overarching consciousness of which each of us is an expression. And all on his own, he came to that understanding. And then shortly thereafter, he encountered uh, Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, which is based on the the principles of, of Eastern spirituality which is to say exactly that, that this whole creation is a manifestation of the infinite spirit, and the more deeply we attune to that underlying reality, the more everything in our life flows. And then Yogananda had translated it into a very systematic, philosophical, uh, and and practical approach of meditation and of, of right attitude and right behavior. And so Kriyananda, at the age of 22, went from New York to Los Angeles. This is 1948, mind you. Mm-hmm. So when to, to leave everything and go follow an Eastern guru was about as lunatic as you could do. There was no context for it. But he left everything. And he went to Yogananda, and the first words he said is, I want to be your disciple. And Yogananda accepted him. So Kriyananda's uh, uh, learning came as a, a training and a transference of consciousness from his own spiritual master. What exactly can we do to put holy back into the holidays? Well, I think the first thing to understand is that we is that it's an it's important to do it. What holy means, as I was saying a moment ago, it's not about dogma or mm-hmm. religion. Holy means to have a sense of wonder, to have a sense of relationship to the inner joy, to have a sense of deeper meaning about what we're doing. So I would say the first thing to understand is that we need to make it a priority. Um, It's not that family and fun isn't also a reasonable priority, but we need to put a deeper foundation under it. Um, A few suggestions I I would begin with is, first I would say, take the time to contemplate what what, uh, the concept of God means to you, what does Spirit mean to you, how would you yourself define an experience of uplifted consciousness. And the most beautiful explanation of it is simply the inner spirit of joy. Is there a difference between God and spirit, then? Not really. You know, these words are very inexact in English, and that's why many people who tell me that they're atheists, Mm -hmm. they're not really atheists. They've just rejected every concept of God that's been presented to them, 
Well, is could it could it be choices. because people become atheists because there is so much um, there is so much controversy about religion and who God is, what God is, how God works, where how He doesn't work, if if there's good, if there's evil, isn't it possible that religion, no matter if it's Eastern, Western, has created its own destiny and in my in my <laughs> views its own demise. I think you're absolutely correct. I think that we're, we're, what we're witnessing is the death of religion mm-hmm. and the rise of spirituality. I agree. And I think the distinction is the point. And so spirituality is what we're trying to get back to, which is a sense of the holy within our own consciousness. But if we, we, get, back, if we get back to spirituality and uh-huh. we say, all right, God is just an interpretation of spirituality, Doesn't don't we, in fact, at that time where we say, all right, God is spirituality, we're going after spirituality, aren't we saying that God does not exist? Therefore, if God does not exist, everything that we have believed in, in our own uh, religious theology, is, has been a lie. I don't know if it's been a lie. It's been an incomplete understanding, I think would be more accurate. But this is the way I would put it. In, from the East, the East has a lot to teach the West in this because the East has thousands of words for God, and we tend to, to scorn that mm-hmm. as being, you know, polytheistic or something. But those words describe experiences. Those words are prem, shanti, ananda. That means like love, peace, joy, which is it's not an abstraction. It, I mean, it's not a, a, a dogma. It's I experience it. I experience peace. I experience love sometimes on such a transcendent level that I can only call it God. Mm. Do you see what I mean? See the difference? Yes, it I do. It comes from our own experience. However, however, how, however, how do we know that the Eastern religious philosophies are right and that the information that they are giving to the Westerners who are seeking to grasp right. onto anything is true? The wonderful thing about spirituality, as my teacher Swami Kriyananda has presented it, is very simple. It's called the science of religion. And science in this sense means it's based on experiment and the, and the verifiable experience that comes from that experiment. It's nobody's dogma. It's nobody's word. Mm-hmm. It's your own experience. And when, when I've been teaching this now for four decades, and I just say to people, if it doesn't resonate in your own heart, then don't believe it. You know, I mean, if it doesn't if it doesn't manifest itself to you in mm-hmm. your own life, don't believe it. It's a question of experiment and experience, and so, only. All right. So, would a person who's an atheist uh-huh. be any worse of a person than a person who believes in spirit or a person who believes in God? Well, it's self-evident that many self-proclaimed atheists are better, more noble people than many self-proclaimed religionists. Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. the words and the labels define you. It's a question of generosity of heart, compassion, um, expansiveness of spirit, uh, willingness to sacrifice, self-discipline, refinement, all of these words um, to manifest in your life those qualities of higher consciousness. That's what counts. You can call it the great white apricot if sure. you want to. It doesn't make any difference. You're either living it and experiencing it or you're not. And that's what we need to get back to. All right, Asha, please stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation, very interesting conversation this first hour of tonight's show. It is Wednesday, November the 11th, Remembrance Day here in Canada. And to all our veterans around the world, wherever you may be listening to us here on the Exon, including Armed Forces Radio, thank you for being there. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to live the freedom and democratic life that we do live. And thank you for always being there for us and for at a moment's notice offering the supreme sacrifice in order to protect people at home like me. I'll be back with Asha on the other side of this commercial break as we continue live and around the world from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right here in the X-Zone. Flu season is here again, and this year so is the H1N1 flu virus. By taking some simple steps, you can help protect yourself and others. Wash your hands with soap and warm water for at least 20 seconds. Cough and sneeze into your arm, not your hand. Keep common surfaces and items like doorknobs and keyboards disinfected. 
To find out more, go to fightflu.ca or call 1-800-O-CANADA. Knowledge is your best defense. A message from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Hi, this is Ken Elliott. When I'm floating around the universe, I always try to tune in to Rob McConnell. Hey, hold there, Timothy Frog on Sesame Street. When I want to find out what's going on with UFOs or ghosts, I listen to the X Zone with Rob McConnell. This is Les Corrigan from Target Internet Development. You're listening to Rob McConnell on the X Zone Radio Show. This is John Hogue, Prophecy Scholar, and you're listening to Rob McConnell in the X Zone. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and would somebody get the Muppets out of the studio? Every time they're here, I've got feathers all over the place. And uh, Kermit, come on, take Miss Piggy, go to a motel, go on, scram, scram, scram. There you go. Welcome back, everyone. This is the X Zone on Talk Star and the Voice of Radio. I'm sorry, the Voice of Reality Radio, TV and Radio. Here we are. <sighs> Christmas. It's here already. It seems that we just get through one Christmas season, and bang, here we are again. How important, Asha, are religious holidays? Do they well, are, I, do they act as a reinforcement of belief? I, I think that even, I think the, the inner purpose of, of religious holidays is, is being obliterated right mm-hmm. now, but I, I've lived um, all of my adult life in a spiritual community, and so I know from actual experience what the religious holidays really are intended to do and what they can do. You know, life sometimes gets to be like a rock rolling down a hill, and you, 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 the momentum of it, you don't know how to stop it. And what, what religious holidays are intended to do, what the concept of the weekly Sabbath was intended to do, which has completely been lost, is essentially to reset our systems back to the center point of inner calmness and the center point of inner attunement. And every opportunity that we can have, whether it be daily meditation um, the observation in some form of a Sabbath day every week, or at the very least, these annual events where the focus moves away from ordinary mundane concerns and focuses in on the deeper reality, the deeper purpose behind things. Now, of course, uh, holidays have become um, overwhelmed mm-hmm. with just more and more outward concerns, and I think it's a, an important step that we need to take back these events inwardly and use them as they're intended to be i think they've become over commercialized personally and that oh, absolutely what what the what the meaning of christmas let's use christmas because it's coming right up is okay. is a way for the stores and and other corporations to make money off of a religious family holiday and i think that well, this is very wrong well, it's wrong in the sense that <clears throat> if we make the definition of it only um, materialistic, mm-hmm. then we've really lost. Of course, generosity of heart is a divine quality. Oh, true. Remembering those that we love, mm-hmm. thoughtful um, giving back and forth can be a wonderful thing. It's not so much a question of what we do, it's that we've lost the spirit behind it. It becomes uh, obligatory, competitive, um, self-centered, 
um, so it's it's really a matter of degree. What's happened to us is that we've we've gotten everything has gotten out of hand. And yes, uh, because everybody has to strive to make money, we begin to compete with each other. You know, this is the greatness of America. It's our it's our Achilles heel, and it's also our greatness. Yes, Whatever yes. we do, we really really do it, mm-hmm. and we have the freedom in our country uh, to express our creativity to the max. But uh, a kind of frenzy has set in. You know, in a sense, it's like being divinely corrected because the economy itself is proving unsustainable. You know, I was listening uh, to two children talking the other day, and uh, it was at one of the fast food outlets that kids go love to go eat, and I'd like to say McDonald's, but I won't. And okay. uh, I was I was sitting in the booth behind them, and they were talking, and one youngster says, so what are you getting for Christmas? And he says, well, you know what? I've got to tell you, the greatest part about being in a divorced family is I can play mum against dad. Oh, my God. And the little guy went on to tell his friend how he goes to mom and says, I want a Wi-Fi, and then goes to dad and says, I want a computer. And he actually pits mom against dad in order to get what he wants. Well, we're in a lot of trouble, and we need to pull it back. We sure are. In the sense, you know, the the correction that's coming to us at the moment is, I I believe, is a divine correction in a sense. And I think when we're not able... Mm -hmm to uh, throw money at every situation or, or not expected to throw money at every situation. I think there's going to be such a huge collective sigh of relief. You know, one of my suggestions for putting the holy back in the holidays, as you said, is to start incorporating, as I said, make it a, a holiday experiment, mm-hmm. just a little bit of quiet time every day in which we reset and recenter. And to involve your children in this also, I'm suggesting that for m- many people, especially for children, to ask them to be still and quiet may be impossible, but let it be focused time in which, like, the family sits together and reads something uplifting, a family story, a scripture, a fable, something that reminds them of, uh, of, of their own inner nature. You know, children are very susceptible to how they're trained, and we've just stopped training children um, toward their own inner awareness, and that, so they begin to forget it. But it's naturally there for them. Another suggestion I make is that people should spend time outside. You know, get away and don't take your iPods. I mean, go out into some beautiful place. And there's a wonderful book called Sharing Nature with Children. Do things together that tune you into the natural world. I mean, one really marvelous thing you can do is to go outside at night. You know, take your whole family. And if it's cold, just bundle up under a down quilt and just... Mm -hmm lie on the ground or lie on the balcony and just look up at the stars and and see yourself in relation to something greater. Um, it, you'll find it, it does so much to uh, reset yourself and bring you back to what's important. We've forgotten about the family unit, the, un- the, the, the amount of love and, and, and that feeling of thankfulness that families can generate. In today's society, the family of 2009, where mom is on her iPod, dad is on his Blackberry, sister is on her little laptop at the dinner table, MSN or texting, and uh, little brother's on Facebook chatting to a friend of his. This is all wrong. Like, there's something wrong with society. Get rid of the electronic crap at the supper table and talk to each other. Communicate. When I was a child growing up and when our children would come over to the house and when they do come over to the house, now we talk. You know, it's it's a strange concept, talking. Well, you know, I think we have to work our way back to this gradually. And I think some individual in the family has to take leadership. Mm -hmm. I suggest Mm -hmm. it not not be done without structure, because merely to have everybody suddenly have no distractions and just stare at each other may not immediately create uh, great experiences in positive family dynamics. But, you know, we've always had that family dynamic. It's nothing that we've ever stopped. Right. So children come over. There's, there's, There's the hugging. There's the family unity. There is the the constant communication. No one, no one will use their cell phone in the house. They don't accept calls. They're here to see mom and dad. It's a family time, and family is very important to us all. I think that's profoundly true. You know, I think what's happened to us all now is that we've we've lost touch with our roots, and what mm-hmm. I'm really strongly suggesting is that we, we need to systematically get back to it. It may be forced upon us by, by challenging economic times that don't give us options, 
But still, we have a television and a radio right in the house. Yes. So I, I'm suggesting that the best way to do it is to begin with a specific, almost a specific exercise. Okay, everyone, for 10 minutes, you know, we're going to sit and, and each person's going to, you know, just say the most meaningful part of being part of this family or the most meaningful part of Christmas to me or the most uh, beautiful experience I've had this year. And everybody's going to take turns speaking about it. Or I suggest maybe you create actually, you know, let's get together and create a family ritual. And mm-hmm. if it's not a, a biological family, maybe it's a family of friends. And you tell everyone in advance, we're all going to come over to our house at, you know, at noon on Christmas Day. And everybody should bring with them some piece of creative yeah. work, you know, a poem or a song. And we'll, we'll take turns, uh, you know, expressing what's in us. And, or maybe we can together build um, a holy a holy place in the house. We'll clear off a table, and everybody brings something that is spiritually meaningful to them. Maybe oh, it's no. a you know a religious symbol. Maybe it's a feather. Maybe it's a stone that they found, and every person brings it and then takes turns telling one another why I brought this and what it means to me. And I think if we restructure um, it just a little bit including the children, then whereas people might be cynical or a little nervous at the concept, Mm -hmm. give them the experience. That's what I was saying earlier about what makes spirituality. Spirituality is to have an actual experience. People will go toward what feels good to them. So we need to sort of create experiences that awaken us uh, to the simple inner pleasures. I read in a, a newspaper about economic hard times and he gave about 10 points of things you can do, you know, like how to find a job and so yeah. on. But the 10th was very important. This is a very good time to develop an inner spiritual life. Because when uh, external conditions are changing, one needs to have a point within oneself. And this is the practice of meditation. This is the practice of yoga. Um, this is the, the teachings of, of all true spiritual paths, is that sooner or later it comes down to one's own heart, and that own heart in relation to higher consciousness. Well, if we if we are created in the likeness of our creators, then the creator is inside of us, and by examining or even going within ourselves, we will bring the creator out in each one of us. And we've forgotten the simplicity of life over the years because of our fast-paced life. And I think we just have to get back to the simple basics. And you've described a number of them over the last hour, and and you've made a lot of sense. You know, I feel like this is like a groundswell movement. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, you know, earlier in this program, I'm a uh, devoted student of Swami Kriyananda, who's an American yogi. And uh, his, his basic teaching is the name of my website, The Joy is Within You. That's my website, and that's the teaching, The Joy is Within You. And is that the way you live? Pardon me? That's the walk you walk and the talk you talk. I've done nothing else since I was 19 years old, truthfully. But I've also, Mm -hmm. I've hardly lived a sequestered life. I've traveled all over the world. I know I have thousands of friends, literally, and have had an extremely interesting life. But it's all been based on this very simple idea that there is is such a thing as higher consciousness, Mm -hmm. that higher consciousness is accessible by deliberate effort, and that higher consciousness is the source of bliss. This is what well, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom of God? It's within you. That's right. Heaven is within you. And the, the science of yoga, which is now known mostly for yoga postures, but the mm-hmm. teaching of it is meditation, and it says, Joy is within you. The joy is within you. And there's but no difference, course, and a lot of people do not realize there is no difference between meditation and prayer. Well, it's a, it's a relationship. Both are a relationship with mm-hmm. a higher reality. That's Sometimes right. And, and when scientists, when scientists have, have measured the brain waves and brain yeah. wave patterns in those who are meditating and who are in deep prayer, they're identical. Oh, I see what you yeah. mean. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, sometimes people say prayer is uh, telling God what you feel and meditation is listening for his answer. Which is, it to say, a conversation. I, I yeah. think they're both one and the same, because in any form of communication, there is the talking and then the listening. I think it's absolutely correct. I would encourage uh, the people listening to this, if you're new to these practices, 
Um, don't think that you can just, oh, I'll just go into a dark room and I'll sit down and I'll shut my nope. eyes. I was, I was in a taxi in Chicago and the, the taxi driver, when he heard I was a meditation teacher, he says, oh, I tried it. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I said, what did you do? He said, I went in my room. I turned off the light. I shut my eyes and I didn't feel anything. Oh, my goodness. He said, well, there's a little more art and science to it. There certainly so, is. I would suggest, if if you're interested in trying this, it's not hard these days to find mm-hmm. even a little bit of instruction or a guided meditation or an uplifting piece of music, something to help you, help guide your thoughts and feelings to a, a more refined level. It's it's a practice. It's not a an automatic thing like anything worth doing. You have to work at it a little bit. But the fact is, if you can breathe, you can meditate. Asho, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I love your message. I love the way you think. And I'd love to have you back on in the future. Thank you, Rob. It's been very nice to speak with you. Asho Praver has been our special guest. www.thejoyiswithinyou.com That's www.thejoyisinyou.com And we'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past. As we continue on the VORR, the Voice of Reality Radio and Television Network. We'll be back. Don't go away. And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you from the studios of the Relmar McConnell Media Center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, the home of the Exxon Radio and TV show. The following is a tribute to the members of the Canadian Armed Forces, past, present, and future, with love and respect from everyone here. Thank you very much for all that you've done, all that you will do, and all that you are doing to keep Canada the true North strong and free. Flanders Fields by John McRae In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. (laughs) 